Coordination Committee and the Syrian American Council Los Angeles. I salute all of you and welcome you here to our fourth town hall meeting. Our thanks to the Libyan and Egyptian organizations and the Tunisian and the Lebanese communities for their support. تحية إكبار وإجلال لثوارنا الأبطال في سوريا ولثوارنا العرب في مصر وليبيا وتونس واليمن وفي كل بلد عربي يناظر من أجل الحرية والديمقراطية. Greetings and great respect to our heroes, our revolutionaries in Syria, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Yemen, and every Arab country which is fighting for freedom and democracy. إذا الشعب يوما أراد الحياة فلا بد أن يستجيب القدر. If the people want to live someday, then fate has to respond to the people. أنا الشعب أنا الشعب لا يعرف المستحيل. We are the people, we are the people who don't know the impossible. واحد 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 الشعب السوري واحد one 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 the Syrian people are one the people united will never be defeated this year is going to go up in history as the great Arab revolutions rear it will be marked as the revolutions year to end tyranny corruption injustice in equality and to start a new era in a human history full of freedom, transparency, justice, and equality. We have tonight great speakers to represent the Arab revolutions of Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria. Please let me introduce you to the Arab Revolutions panel, Dr. Nouri Ghana. Ghana. Dr. Mohammed Hassanin. Dr. Jamal Al Hned. Mr. William Picard. And coming up. Mr. Saeed Mushtahid. <laughs> Dr. Nuna Ghana is an associate professor. I'm going to introduce one by one. <laughs> Ghana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I thought I'm in, uh, if you write it in Arabic, there is no. So we'll go. Okay. Dr. Nouri Ghana is an associate professor of comparative literature and Near Eastern languages and culture at UCLA. He has published articles on modernist and post-colonial Arab literature in academic journals. His op-ed pieces on the new developments in the Arab world has been printed by The Guardian, El Payas, El Pais, the Electronic uh, Intifada, and Counterpunch. Ghana's book, Signifying Loss Toward a Poetic of Narrative Morning, was published this year. He is completing a book on Arab uh, melancholy and editing a collection of essays on the Tunisian Revolution, tentatively titled genealogies of descent, mapping and remapping of the Tunisian Revolution. Please welcome Dr. Ghana. Thank you, Samir. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I uh, have to thank um, um, the organizers and um, uh, particularly Samir Gwir and Omar Kah for the invitation. And uh, I have also to, to, to thank Mahmoud Ibrahim for the carpool ride. That was very nice. Uh, 
So, uh, lest I should really um, get carried by the many things that I have to say, I prepared a little little speech, so I'm just going to read it, you know, in order to really avoid all kind of complications if I speak just like that. Um, so I just came from the Middle East Studies Association annual convention uh, held in Washington, D.C. And I can say or report to you that I heard lots of myths about the Arab uprisings. Uh, I want to say a few words about the Tunisian uprising and about the elections that took place uh, on October 23rd. And in the meanwhile, I hope to shatter one or two of the myths that have been uh, circulating with dizzying routine uh, uh, recently. One of the enduring myths uh, that seem to me to have the worst political implications is the myth that the Tunisian uprising was a surprise. You hear this a lot. Now I have lived in Tunisia for 25 years, and since 98, I have traveled there every summer and have always come to the same conclusion that one day this country would explode. The interesting thing is that everyday Tunisians would tell you the same thing again and again. It might be true that a dictatorship of the caliber of Ben Ali's regime should break so briskly is a surprise. Yet how much of a surprise can it be if it was inevitable? If we take into consideration the basic fact that Tunisia has always boasted the highest literacy rate in the region, which, it re which reached recently 90%. Wouldn't it be more surprising if Tunisians did not eventually rise up against the dictator? Ben Ali was eager to achieve high literacy rates so as to embellish his reputation, but that worked against him in the end. There is a, a, a saying or a maxim in, in, in Tunisian culture which goes as follows. So it means, uh, roughly it means, if it were not for their blindness, we wouldn't be able to live or deal with them. So in this case, Ben Ali was blind really to what he was doing when he was interested in uh, increasing uh, literacy. Um, so Ben Ali has always played the game of democracy, the game of women's rights, the game of human rights, even though he really did not respect any, and the game of modernity and education for all. But he did not do that out of a belief in those rights, only to the extent they served his, uh, to cast a positive light on his uh, image as the father of the nation. What he did not realize, luckily for us, is that he would be played by the game he played. And this is exactly the power of revolutions. I would say that the Tunisian uprising or revolution in progress should be seen as something inevitable and not as something surprising. Consider, for instance, that the early protesters both in Tunisia and Egypt were reiterating Abu al-Qasim al-Shabi's most compelling and influential opening lines of his poem, Iradat al-Hayat, which uh, Samir just recited some of them. Um, this poem refers back to Tunisia's nationalist struggle against French colonial rule, which started... Is it good? Very good, thank you. Um, the, the, what I want to say here is that basically is that the Tunisians did not see a difference between fighting French colonialism and fighting the indigenous uh, regimes that came after that, uh, from Bourguiba and Ben Ali regimes. And so this is part of the reason why they returned to the 1930s to Abu al-Qasim al-Shabi. And that's why, you know, إذا الشعب يوما أراد الحياة فلا بد أن يستجيب القدر ولا بد للليل أن ينجلي ولا بد للقيد أن ينكسر once the people assert that will, this is, I mean, it's very hard to translate these couplets. So I think this is the best I could achieve. And please tell me if, uh, you know, uh, if I was uh, right. Once the people assert their will to life, destiny must answer their call. Their night will have to retreat and vanish, their chains to break and fall. The resurrection of Ashebi's memorable lines should not be understood as a mere form of facile sloganeering, 
but as an evocation of the inextricable relationship between fighting foreign and indigenous forms of oppression. So Tunisian uprising was perceived by protesters themselves as part of the anti-colonial struggle, which for them has never ceased. Think about all the political activists and oppositional figures who said no to French colonialism, and then no to Bourguiba, and then no to Ben Ali, from the martyr of the Tunisian revolution, Farhat Hashad, to such long-term political opponents and opposition leaders like Rashid al ghannoushi Hamal Hamami, and Munsuf al-Marzouqi, among so many others. Think about the many journalists, novelists, playwrights, filmmakers, intellectuals, lawyers, high school teachers, as well as university professors, who in one way or another helped keep alive a culture of critique and dissent that translated in an all-out revolt when it was set in motion by Muhammad Bouazizi's spark. Even soccer players, thinkers, and other popular figures have at times embraced and passed on the tradition of dissent in the Tunisian public sphere, sphere, whether through explicit or encoded means and intents. Socio-political and cultural critique is there in Tunisian cinema, theater, as well as in poetry and music. Whoever studies Tunisian literature and culture, which is exactly what I do, so, um, since independence, would not miss the latent or indirect critique it carried and disseminated. Now, once we start thinking about the longevity of cultural dissent, about the longevity of political opposition and activism, we might dispel some of the myths about the Tunisian Revolution, which was called by so many names, such as the WikiLeaks Revolution. I mean, where does that come from? We knew everything before the WikiLeaks or the Twitter revolution, or the Facebook revolution, and then, you know, most of all, Al Jazeera revolution and the Jasmine revolution. Um, but the, the, most, the, the favored one was the Dignity revolution, and the Sidi, the Sidi Bouzid and the Muhammad Bazizi revolution. Um, obviously, there is no gain saying the fact that Bazizi's self-emulation, that social media, that Al Jazeera played a pivotal role in sparking protests and relay, relaying reports of dispersed agitations in the southwestern regions of Tunisia at a time when mainstream media was deliberately oblivious uh, to what's going on in Sidi Bouzid, Tala, and Gasrid. However, if we focus entirely on social media, we might miss the many ways in which the Tunisian uprising is the product of a long tradition of collective action by non-collective actors. What is interesting is that collective and civic action continued even after the revolution, after January 14th. And in fact, were it not for the successive sit-in protests in the, the Qasba government square, we would not have had a constituent assembly election on October 23rd. It was the sit-in protest in the Qasba government square which went around the clock for a dozen days and nights from February 20th to March 3rd that asked for a new constitution and for a constituent assembly elections. The sit-in protest composed mostly of young and marginalized Tunisians refused to become a movement or to endorse a specific party. Eventually, however, most of those young activists were absorbed by political parties. Now, regarding the elections themselves, I mean, I was asked to speak about the elections, so I will do so. Uh, let me say at the outset that every Tunis everyone in Tunisia and elsewhere was hopeful but apprehensive, because the interim prime minister, Beji Qaid Sibsi, it's a very familiar name in Tunisia, uh, had confessed to Ahmed Mansour on Al Jazeera, and this, you know, this is was seen via uh, Hadith al Thawra. You know, there's a program called Hadith al Thawra, the talk of the revolution or something. So he came on Al Jazeera and he said that this is going to be the first democratic election. And Ahmed Mansour, of course, was a clever guy, and he told himself, so "You're admitting there has never been any democratic elections." And he said, "Yes, I do admit 
And I do admit also that I myself have, have rigged the elections many times and the Burkiba. And so everybody was scandalized. You know, that this guy, you know, of course we, we knew that elections were rigged all the time, but for him to come so publicly and say that they were rigged, shed further light on his credibility and his honesty to be able to uh, deliver really a democratic election. So not so many Tunisians trusted that he would actually keep to his promise and not interfere with the electoral process, which was luckily overseen by an autonomous body called the Independent High Authority for the Elections. However, the elections did actually deliver. What is inter interesting is that despite the more than 100 parties, and there were like 111 or something, and hundreds of independents that took part in these elections. Tunisians voted in great numbers. Tunisians voted in great numbers for the parties and political leaders who have established credentials and a long history of resisting and opposing Bourguiba and Ben Ali. There has been and there, are, there currently are some problems and some fears that Tunisia will turn into a theocracy. But these fears are unrealistic given the liveliness of the public sphere and the irrecoverable rights of speech and protest that Tunisians have earned by blood. It might take some time and great sacrifice, more sacrifice for these rights to belong finally to all Arabs, but again, let me wager on my sense of finitude here and say that this is indeed has become inevitable. Democracy is now not an option. It is a historical inevitability. I want to conclude by invoking a scene from the Battle of Algiers in which the captured guerrilla fighter and prominent Algerian leader of the FLN, the National Liberation Front, during the War of Independence, his name is Larbi bin Hidi, uh, gives, when he gives the FLN's view um, about the role of, uh, about its view of what was happening during the Algerian war. And so when he was asked if the rebels have any chance of winning, he replies calmly. And this is what he said. The FLN has more chance of beating the French army than the French have of changing the course of history. End of quote. So even though the FLN lost the Battle of Algiers and the film shows how its leaders were being picked up uh, one by one, climaxing with the French soldiers blowing up the house where Ali Lapointe was hiding, the Algerians won the war because they were on the side of history. The French might have won the battle but lost the war because they were not able to change the course of history. Let me conclude then by saying that today, everyday Syrians have more of a chance of beating the Assad dictatorship than Assad has of changing the course of history which was set in motion in Tunisia.